We in America are immigrants, or the children of immigrants. We are one people, but a people welded from many nations and races. The immigration debate in the U.S. is replete with rhetoric that makes it seem like immigration is essential to the U.S.'s very survival. We hear all the time from the left that the U.S. is a, quote, nation of immigrants, that we are a melting pot, or, as that famous poem dictates, that the U.S. is obliged to take in the world's poor huddled masses. This narrative, pushed by SJWs, the media, and the left in general, that America has always been and must always be an open borders utopia, it's far from the truth. In fact, the U.S. has, throughout history, had some of the world's strictest immigration laws and policies. So let's take a look back in time and find out the truth about American immigration policy. While the colonies officially declared independence in 1776, the U.S. Constitution wasn't ratified until 1788. One of the first pieces of legislation passed by the U.S. legislature was the Naturalization Act of 1790. This bill limited the naturalization of new citizens to anybody that was a, quote, free white person who had lived in the U.S. for at least two years and was of, quote, good moral character. Essentially, the 1790 Naturalization Act established the U.S. as a white ethnostate, and it effectively prohibited Indians, former and freed slaves, and indentured servants from ever becoming citizens. And this law wasn't seen as too harsh or some kind of mistake that was immediately overturned. The founders of this country clearly intended for the U.S. to be established as an outpost of Europe and European tradition, but free from the trappings of monarchy and authoritarianism. Now, you probably haven't learned about the 1790 Naturalization Act in your history classes. You probably also didn't hear about the 1795 Naturalization Act that extended the residency requirement from two years to five, making it even harder to be a citizen, and explicitly, like in the first sentence of the law, restated that people were only eligible for citizenship if they were, quote, a free white person. The 1798 Naturalization Act extended the residency requirement again to 14 years, and in 1802, the naturalization law was passed. This piece of legislation kept the, quote, free white person requirement in place and extended birthright citizenship to the children of U.S. citizens only, but not to the children of foreigners temporarily in the U.S. Now, this law passed in 1802 and was actually the last major piece of legislation dealing with immigration and naturalization for over 50 years. So, from 1790 until 1870, becoming a citizen was a privilege reserved only for people of European descent. This changed in 1870, after the Civil War, when the Naturalization Act of 1870 was passed. This act expanded citizenship eligibility to, quote, aliens of African nativity and to persons of African descent. This is the bill that allowed freed slaves to become citizens, and it effectively allowed for free migrants from Africa to become citizens as well, provided they met their residency requirements. And, two years before that, the 14th Amendment to the Constitution was ratified. The 14th Amendment states that, quote, "...all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside." End quote. To this day, there is still quite a bit of legal dispute over whether the 14th Amendment right to birthright citizenship should apply to the children of illegal immigrants or people who come here as visitors. This is a complex constitutional question, and I'll save that debate for another video, but suffice to say that, given the legal context at the time, and the lack of any real stringent immigration laws that differentiated between legal and illegal immigration, which we'll talk about later, many constitutional scholars interpret the 14th Amendment right to birthright citizenship as not being intended to apply to the children of illegal immigrants. Anyways, as of 1870, becoming a citizen was open to pretty much anyone, provided they met their residency requirements. This is used by many on the left as rationale for modern arguments for open borders, acceptance of third world migrants, etc. But this isn't where the story ends. I just mentioned the fact that the U.S. didn't really, as a country at this point, have an immigration policy as we'd refer to it today. There was a naturalization process for people to become citizens, yes, but there wasn't much thought given to immigration policy. Why is that? Well, for starters, up to this point, almost all immigration to the U.S. had come from Europe. The people coming to America were almost entirely European. One-third of immigrants from 1815 to 1865 were Irish, and the vast majority of the rest were from Western and Northern Europe. These people assimilated rather easily into American culture, with relatively little ghettoization. There were some examples of white groups not getting along, for example the Irish and the Italians, but these things ultimately worked themselves out as immigration slowed down and as immigrant groups assimilated. The first real example of U.S. immigration policy came in 1882 with the Chinese Exclusion Act. It prohibited the importation of Chinese workers into the U.S., many of which were being used to build the railroads in the western U.S. Interestingly enough, this act was controversial at the time because Chinese immigrants tended to not be a drain on social welfare systems. Most of them were young men without families, so they weren't really adding pressure onto the school or hospital systems, and most of them were working in the U.S. with the intent of going back home once the railroad job was done. The next big piece of immigration policy came in 1924 with the Johnson-Reed Immigration Act. 
See, America had been experimenting with relatively open immigration for nearly 50 years at this point, and they were starting to realize that it doesn't really work. If too many immigrants come in over too short a period of time, they don't assimilate and end up forming their own balkanized communities. We saw this in the 1800s with the Irish and Italians, and we see this today with Somalians, Nigerians, and other immigrant groups. So what was the Johnson-Reed Act? Well, in the words of historians, it was designed to, quote, preserve the ideal of American homogeneity, end quote. It restricted the immigration of Eastern European Jews, as well as Italians and some other Southern Europeans. Russia's 1917 Bolshevik Revolution was fresh on the minds of the American public, and many were concerned about foreign immigrants bringing communist ideals and political action into the country. Incidentally, Vladimir Lenin and Leon Trotsky, two of the leading communists behind the Bolshevik Revolution that killed tens of thousands and led to the Soviet Union that killed tens of millions, were both Eastern European Jews. So the legislators' concerns over Eastern European Jewish migration were not entirely unfounded. The law stated that no one ineligible to become a citizen could immigrate to the U.S. at all, indicating that the 14th Amendment probably was not designed to apply to illegal immigrants. The Johnson-Reed Act passed the House and Senate and was signed into law by Calvin Coolidge. It faced very little resistance in the House, except from a New York representative named Emanuel Seller, who was, according to Wikipedia, a, quote, Brooklyn representative and Jewish American. Now, these immigration restrictions were actually good for the economy. They kept unemployment low, and they helped mitigate the effects of the Great Depression in the 1930s. Now, things would change, however, in 1965. Remember Emanuel Seller? Well, he comes back in 1965 with the Immigration and Nationality Act, a piece of legislation that changed America forever. The 1965 Immigration Act eliminated national origin as a basis for immigration. Furthermore, it limited immigration from the Western Hemisphere, while allowing massive increases in immigration from all over the world. Before 1965, the vast majority of immigrants were European. In fact, during the 1950s, approximately 70% of all immigrants came from either Europe or Canada. Since the passage of the Hart-Seller Act, this has changed. Now, immigration from Asia and Hispanic countries makes up nearly 85% of all immigration. At the time, legislators promised that the Hart-Seller Act would not affect American demographics in the long term, but either they had no idea what they were talking about, or they were blatantly lying. The numbers tell the story. In 1965, America was an 85% white country, with a white majority, obviously. By the year 2050, America will actually become a minority white country. That's a nearly 50% decrease in the white population in less than 100 years. From the birth of this country until 1965, it was quite clear that America was intended to be a free country where European values and culture could flourish. Throughout the 18th, 19th, and early 20th centuries, America made it quite clear that we are a country of immigrants, but only for the right type of immigrants, and in small enough quantities that they can assimilate. The truth is that mass migration doesn't work. Third world migration usually doesn't work. When we bring in millions of people at a time and don't force them to learn English or assimilate, they will continue living as if they are in their home country, while collecting our welfare benefits. Some cultures and people just aren't compatible with Western society, and the founders knew this, which is why they were so insistent that these kind of people be kept out of America. This has nothing to do with silly accusations of white supremacy or anything like that. If this type of drastic demographic change were happening in Asian, African, or Middle Eastern countries, that would be concerning for me as well. People and culture are linked. Does anybody really believe that if Japan were suddenly 50% Somali, Japanese culture and tradition would stay the same? What if India were to become majority white? Would their historical traditions continue, or would things be changed to look distinctly more European and less Indian? Every culture and every people on Earth has a right to exist, and every country has a right to defend itself from demographic changes that will fundamentally and permanently alter that country's culture and identity. I want Nigeria to remain Nigerian. I want Japan to remain Japanese. I want America to remain American. I want my grandchildren to grow up in the same country my grandparents grew up in, not as a hated minority in their own country. It amazes me that this opinion one based in love for family and tradition, is now construed as hateful or Nazi by the left and the mainstream media. We live in a world where hating white people will get you a job at any public university, but saying you're proud to be white will get you labeled as a racist bigot. This has to stop. We have to wake up from this idea we've been brainwashed into that it's racist or hateful to want your country to remain the way it is. I don't hate anyone except people that wish to do me harm. I'm not a Nazi. I'm just someone who wants the best for myself, my family, my future kids, and I know, based on all available evidence in history, that being a minority is not something I want for myself or for my progeny. Our ancestors knew this. It's time we rediscover the truth that political correctness has hidden from us and make sure America's immigration policies put Americans, not foreigners, first.